It gives me a really great pleasure to introduce our next moderator of this panel, Tamara Gould. Tamara is the Vice President of Distribution for the Independent Television Service, ITVS, where she oversees domestic distribution of international documentaries from around the world through the ITVS International Media Development Fund. But we are especially indebted to Tamara here at the Institute for being our thought partner on creating the whole Media as Global Diplomat series. The, the first of which, as I said earlier today, was co-sponsored by ITVS in February so she not only worked with us to produce that important event, but she's even agreed to help us again, as you can see. Um, and I think we're in the process of making you an official US IP ID card. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tam to get us going, because we really do have a rich and full schedule here. Well, first, let me say thank you to Sheldon and USIP. It is always a pleasure to work with USIP on these events, and we're so happy to be part of the Media as Global Diplomat series of summits. Um, second, also thank you to the Alliance of Civilization and, and to Shamil, because this research that you guys have, have um, undertaken really affirms my professional lifetime of, um, as a filmmaker and, and a public media executive, we, we feel that our work has tremendous impact. We know audiences are affected by what we do, but we've never had the neuroscience behind it to actually um, underscore what it is that we're doing. So thank you. The field thanks you. I also want to mention that this, this stream, in addition to being on USIP.org, uh, is also on ITVS.org, reaching our network of about 16,000 independent filmmakers around the world. So hopefully they were exposed to the information from the report. We're happy to publish that also to our network because I think people will be just delighted. I really cannot imagine a stronger panel um, to have next to me and hopefully joining us by video conference from Hollywood as well to really pick up from the conversation that we had this morning um, and talk about really in a way as practitioners where the rubber hits the road on this research and how if we know what I think probably we always felt to be true, which is that our work has an impact, but if it is now from the Harvard and MIT research really demonstrated beyond a shadow of a doubt that the work that we're creating has real power to resolve conflict, to create conflict, how does that change what we as media makers do? But before we jump into what I hope is a very lively discussion, um, I do want to pick up um, Queen Noor's point. I should also say I, I'm, I'm fortunate to be here since I did not go to high school with, uh, with Queen Noor. Uh, I did, however, go to high school with the boy who was eaten by his own braces and poltergeist. So I don't know. I don't know what that says. <laughs> but uh, let, me, uh, let me introduce who I have sitting with me here today. Um, and then I do want to also get take a little pulse of who is in the room with us because you guys will be a vital part of this conversation, and so I'll get to you guys in a moment. But first, um, do we have Mike with us yet? Yes. Oh, Mike, I, am I getting it to see Mike? Yeah. Oh, terrific. Yeah. Mike, welcome. Thank you for joining us. On my Mike. left, I have Mike Metavoy, who is a Hollywood studio executive of over 300 feature films, uh, films you might have heard of, like uh, Raging Bull, Apocalypse Now. Um, and also the author of this book, uh, Mike, I think I've bought out every copy that is on Amazon so uh, to share with colleagues, um, which is um, called American Idol After Iraq, Winning Hearts and Minds in the Global Media Age. We'll be speaking with Mike in some detail about this because I think it is a treatise for our times in many ways on these issues. Next, Riz Khan, next to me, senior news anchor for Al Jazeera English who has interviewed literally thousands of guests, including Jimmy Carter, Bill Clinton, the Dalai Lama, Nelson Mandela. So if for some reason I'm taken out during this panel, Riz will just take over. <laughs> uh, um, I'll jump to the end. Arik Bernstein, who is a documentary filmmaker, founder of Alma Films, the uh, producer of Unmistaken Child, which is a film that ITBS International had the, had the um, luck to be involved in as a, as a co-producer, which will be airing on um, our series, Independent Lens, on PBS next month. An amazing film. He's also the creator of Gaza Sterot, Life in Spite of Everything, a project that reports on life as experienced by men, women, and children in Israel and Palestine. And we're going to have a chance 
for Arik to really take us through that site because it is one of the most outstanding examples of using a new platform combined with video to really have a powerful, powerful impact. Um, and finally, Lucas Welch, who is the president and founder of Celia, a nonprofit organization that is really a leader in using new technologies to facilitate dialogue between students from diverse backgrounds around the world. Um, we heard a bit from Cynthia and Shamal about how they're already working with Celia. We'll have a chance to hear from um, uh, from Lucas and more detail about Celia and how many of you yourselves and the work that you do might engage. And with that, I did just want to have a sense of how many people in the room are media makers? Right. And how many are media broadcasters? Okay, it's a small group. <laughs> and how many are policy makers? Terrific. And how many are working in uh, research or NGOs? Terrific. Terrific, thank you. That, that I think will help us have a sense of who we're with today. And I don't want to ignore our online audience. I know we have over 100 people registered to be watching this. Joel, do you want to give us an update on who is watching from around the world and also how they might continue to engage with this conversation? Absolutely. Uh, the audience has actually been growing as word is spreading on Twitter and new people are tuning in. <laughs> so the social networks are working for us to expand awareness. Um, We've got people all across the Middle East, uh, in Europe, a lot of folks from the UK, and in Asia, where it's trending towards midnight. So some of them are in their pajamas, I think, watching our, <laughs> our webcast. Uh, for folks online who are just tuning in, uh, we encourage you to use our chat box or use Twitter, uh, where you can participate in the debate online and also pose questions that I'll feed to the panelists. Um, the hashtag for Twitter users is pound M-A-G-D, so please include that in your post so that it will show up on our webcast page. And uh, Midan is also now translating uh, some of the online discussion into Arabic at Midan.net. Terrific. Um, so first, I'm, I'm going to wear my filmmaker hat for a moment and just say, gosh, it is so hard to be a filmmaker. Um, we not only have to get the financing for our work and have to bring to life as artists a creative vision, now we have to factor in how our audiences are responding and if indeed we're responsible for what they do once they see our films. Um, and we have to be business people who are trying to sell our work. And we have to also, as reporters and journalists, report the news as we find it. There are so many competing priorities, I think all of which are represented by our different panelists. Um, Riz, I think as the broadcaster on our panel, I want to talk um, and play devil's advocate here for a moment, especially around Jazeera and Jazeera's role in terms of reporting violence. I think you know, the research that we've heard about this morning on the panel um, spend a fair amount of time discussing television coverage in the Middle East. And I wanted to read something verbatim from the report, since I'm sure not all of us have had the chance to read the long report, although we will very soon. Um, unlike in America, where images of the wars in Iraq or Afghanistan are and were heavily, heavily censored, the Arab world was exposed to raw, real-time footage, mangled bodies, firefights, the aftermath of suicide bombs, grieving families, fill many Muslim screens for at least part of the 228 minutes a day on average that Middle Easterners are watching television. During the Israeli attacks on Lebanon, both Al Manar and Al Jazeera set repeated footage of civilian death to music for 12 hours. So Riz, we hear from this research that images of violence against one's group can cause outrage, humiliation, anger. So Al Jazeera, known for its transmission of unrelenting images of violence in the name of speaking the truth, do you feel, given these findings, that the network is perpetuating the cycle of violence in some way? We have to, uh, hi everyone by the way, including those in their pajamas. Um, <laughs> I, I think you have to, well first, first of all, differentiate between um, the different broadcasters and different, differentiate uh, to whom they're broadcasting. Um, Al Jazeera Arabic broadcast to uh, an Arab uh, audience, an Arabic language speaking audience globally as well. And, and the crucial thing is that for a lot of people in the Middle East, they hadn't seen um, a true reflection of what was going on in the region um, through the national Arab broadcasters. So they felt that uh, suddenly here was Al Jazeera showing them things that they had never seen before. They'd never seen an Israeli, for example. They'd never heard an Israeli speak. So Al Jazeera was crossing real boundaries there. And uh, one of the interesting things is that uh, um, it's a channel that 
so many people watch. We've heard huge figures, you know, sort of even in Saudi Arabia, 78% of people watching, though officially they hate the channel. Um, <laughs> the reason being is that people want to hear what's going on. Now, of course, they don't like it when the lens is focused on their own country or on their own culture. Um, but they do want to know what's happening. So Al Jazeera sort of periodically upsets everyone, depending on where the camera's pointing. And until the Gaza conflict um, at the beginning of this year, at the end of last year, uh, Jazeera was the, the only country that in the Middle East that hadn't banned Al Jazeera was Israel, which is kind of ironic. Um, now, the English language channel, of course, has a global audience, um, English language speaking audience. It's a very different kind of audience. So the, the, the output is different, the focus is different, the content, um, uh, the, the weighting of the editorial content is, is different. Um, we try to cover developing countries in the world much more thoroughly, not just the Middle East. Um, of course, it's an Arabic brand, but, it's, um, but it is actually a global channel. And so I think um, it's, if you compare, if you look at the output, you'd see a very different kind of output depending on which channel you're watching. Now, in terms of what's shown, I, I, I sometimes jokingly, well, it's not that funny, but I jokingly call our channel the, the, the stretcher channel because every time I look up, someone seems to be on a stretcher. And, and it's pretty miserable. Um, with my own show, I try to go beyond the stretches and try and do issues and, and cover uh, areas, human development issues um, and, and social issues that perhaps don't get covered in the news. The news is a very different beast uh, from the programming. And the thing is that um, it's very easy to uh, it's very easy to sanitize the news, but it's also very easy to sensationalize it, as you say. Now, putting you know putting pictures to music that you know it's not something I'm a fan of because I feel editorially that uh, that, that it taints uh, in the same way that certain phrases and certain words uh, can taint the way the uh, the story is presented. Um, when I was at the BBC, and I, I was trained at the BBC, and I, I see Al Jazeera English a lot like the BBC in its nature, largely because we have such a large British uh, management and, and team. But I remember going to Austria one Christmas uh, when the Ceausescu regime fell. And the pictures on Austrian TV showed mass graves and, and bodies. And, and it was, I, was, I was shocked, actually, how gory it was. And here I was working in news and seeing stuff that we certainly wouldn't have shown on the BBC. So I was like, how, do, how are they allowed to show this? That was my first exposure to how differently different countries uh, present and handle the news. Um, we would never have shown anything like that on the BBC. Of course, that's changed. And now um, there's a far greater... Uh, far higher threshold on what's allowed and what, what isn't allowed. So and I think this is one of the issues that uh, people are coming to terms with, that the news on all channels is far more gory. It's far more... Uh, and and I'm, I'm, something I'm not comfortable with. The other day, even on my channel, I saw bodies lying uh, uh, laid out, and the shot just seemed to linger on them. Now, interestingly, when I was at CNN, um, Bill Cosby's son, Innes, I don't know if you remember, was killed in a, in a carjacking. And... This is the way, I mean, this was on domestic CNN, but this is the way I heard it being downstairs at International, is that the producer was, uh, had a, sh a choice between three shots. A wide, very high helicopter shot, which showed there was a body, but didn't really sort of make it very clear. A medium shot, which made it, you know, you could see the body, you could see the person, and a close-up shot, which showed Bill Cosby's son. Um, he went with a medium shot, in actual fact. You know, he said, okay, the close-up's too, too much. And uh, he actually got fired because Bill Cosby phoned up and said, I'm not very happy with the way this was covered. Now, I thought that was very strange. Um, so, you know, the way, the way news is presented, the way it's covered uh, is open to question. I think it's going to some degree in the wrong direction, that it's, it's, it's a bit too gory. But it was interesting. One of my colleagues from the Arabic channel once said, when, when Western journalists were interviewing him, and he said, uh, um, you know, he said, look, you show the missiles uh, being fired, we also show them landing. And so it's a balance between showing the missiles being fired and, and the missiles landing, and, and really then... Uh, editing it in such a way that it's, it's not gratuitous violence. So I do feel there is a problem, and I do feel that there is a little too much violence. It's, it, it's, it's very, very, you know, I mean, me personally, I, I get very, you know, emotionally upset by some of the stuff I see. And I think there's a balance to be struck. Uh, and we may be going a bit, bit, a bit too far. And, and just one, one follow-up question for you, Riz, is that I think the question is how much in Jazeera's mind or in broadcasters' minds do you think it is that it is beyond, you know, whether it's varying levels of violence, it's beyond reporting the news, but that more and more it actually has a hand in shaping world events. Do you agree with that? Well, I, I mean, the news does shape events. I remember I was, um, I was anchoring a news bulletin on CNN where um, stuff is done in a hurry. The resources are limited. Everywhere is cut back, you know, and often scripts, it's different with my own show now. I, I, I manage everything that goes out on air, but I was getting scripts at the last minute. Sometimes things would appear on the prompter that I hadn't had a chance to read through. I remember there was one, uh, one story about an election in, in a country in Africa. I can't remember which one. But the story said after a tense round of voting, the people of so-and-so decided to eject Mr. So-and-so. So, -and -so. so I, I was looking at this as I was reading this, and I was thinking, 
I thought they elected him, not ejected him. And I was just thinking, because it wasn't a story I'd heavily focused on. It. So I took a chance. I said, after a tenth round of voting, the people of so-and-so have decided to elect Mr. So-and-so. <laughs> thinking that, and this will happen. I mean, there are people watching CNN in Africa who will go out onto the street saying, what, he's been elected, you know, and so on. It turns out he was elected. The person had been typing in a hurry and hit the J key instead of the L key, which is just one across from, you know, separated by K. And eject and elect completely reverses the story. So it's very easy to shape the news just through one typo. Um, and it's something that you know, we have to be aware of. This is why proofreading and copy editing is, is so important. But the thing about shaping the news uh, with, with commentary and content is, is a crucial thing. Um, I, I was, it was very heavily uh, beaten into me at the BBC that you know, I have to be careful how I phrase things, not to comment, not to editorialize. Um, it even affects you know, one's daily life. I could go home and say, uh, it's alleged we're having chicken for dinner tonight. I, you know, so, but. Um, but the thing is that, um, you know, we can take it too far. And actually, Robert Fisk, uh, I had him on my show recently, and he said, look, time has come to get past this being neutral. Time has come past to constantly sanitizing through just walking the middle road. You know, there is a problem. There are things that are right and wrong, and you have to accept those. Uh, my position, just through my training, is to say I'm there to facilitate the debate, not to take a position. Uh, but more and more it's happening. And what you're talking about in terms of shaping the news is more and more people have become commentators. And that, that's something I worry about, because we're not there, in my opinion, to commentate on TV. This is how I was trained. Um, but I realize I'm in a very different world, and many people who are analysts end up as commentators. And, and I do worry, because again, it skews the channel, it skews the position of the, the broadcaster. Thank you, Riz. And we'll come back to journalism and also to our citizen uh, commentators, who hopefully are, are going to be making comments. I would like to turn from, from the world of journalism for a moment to the world of Hollywood entertainment. And of course, Mike, uh, can you hear me OK over there? I can. Yes, I can. Terrific. In your recently published book, American Idol, After Iraq, uh, Competing for Hearts and Minds in the Global Age, you say Hollywood has to educate as much as entertain. And now given that Spider-Man 3 has the highest grossing worldwide opening sales of all time, how, my question for you is how realistic is that? What would it take for Hollywood to take up this mantle of responsibility? Well, uh, before I answer that question, you know, I'm, I'm here to uh, do the miracles of technology. <laughs> you seem to be having a lot more fun there than I am, <laughs> which I think is unfair. <laughs> it also proves that, you know, comedy works better in a bigger room than in a small. Um, you know, Hollywood is more than just a group of people running these studios. I mean, it's just, it's everything that goes behind it. It's all the people that work in it. If, if I go back and look at my own life and career, you know, I'm a person born in China of Russian parents, Russian Jews who lived in China during the war. My parents moved to Chile, and I lived in Chile for 10 years, and then came to America. My whole dream was to come to America, but never imagining that I'd wind up in Hollywood. And then all those people in Hollywood that I've met all through the years, you know, were part of the, the fantasy that I had as a child of, wow, what is James Cagney doing? Or what is Humphrey Bogart doing? The business has changed. Um, I don't, I, you know, to answer your question, um, it's, you know, I'm not sure that Hollywood's going to decide to educate because uh, it, it, the, the, there's an old saying that if you want to send a telegram in, in Hollywood, which of course today you wouldn't anyway, uh, you know, call Western Union. Um, it, it's, I don't think it's realistic to, to, to say that they're going to, but I, 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 my sense is that... Uh, the, the, you know, putting out the message will certainly alert them to the fact that somebody has to do something. Well, let me ask you this, and I don't know if you were able to hear uh, the, the presentation this morning on the research, but I, I wanted to get at one of the central narrative driving issues in Hollywood, which, which is sort of this model of the good guys and the bad guys and the black hats and the white hats. These tensions are often at the heart of dramatic narrative in films that we see. Now we're hearing that these stereotypes may actually be having neurological <laughs> effects on our brains as we're watching them and actually inciting us to act in violent ways. How can we shift this to stop the negative cycle of violence? Or, or should we? Is that Hollywood's role or is the role primarily 
to entertain and to you know to to give audiences things that they they keep coming clearly to the theaters to go see. Well, it's it's clear that you can both entertain and educate because you know people are getting even if it's a de- negative message, people are getting a message. Um, the the fact is that Hollywood goes in periods where it does a certain kind of movie and nobody else does anything else because. They're now spending hundreds of millions of dollars making a movie and then exploiting it, uh, which, you know, may be its own demise at, at some point. Uh, there are lots of studios in trouble today. My, you know, my sense is that uh, there's pro- there's, there are channels and product for every, uh, you know, every type of audience, that there's no central way of doing it and th- that there's a lot of choice. Um, maybe less choice because the studios are spending most of their money on on a a type of product, usually one that requires a um, you know a special suit with an S printed on it, or uh, or the, uh, you know s- s- some element of flying is attributed to a human being. But but uh, you know. Uh, it, those those are the kind of movies that apparently people around the world and I don't care where you are in, in the world, you know people go to the movies. Um, you know a sheet is put over in in parts of China where people watch a movie that's been brought in on a on a stolen DVD and put on a on a sheet. So I don't know if that answers the question, but I think it, I think I hope it does. Absolutely, absolutely, and I hope that you can stay with us uh, and take a few questions. Uh, how much longer do we have you? You've got me is, I think, an hour or Fantastic. whatever, a half hour, Terrific. whatever, whatever time you have, I'm fine here. Terrific, that's wonderful. Um, well, I would like to turn to Arik now, as a, as a documentary filmmaker. Um, I think, as a, and sort of in contrast to the to the Hollywood model that we're talking about, as a documentary filmmaker from Israel, a country clearly at the heart of some of the world's greatest conflict that also has a very advanced filmmaking support system uh, in Israel. Um, You've come out with a new project, Gaza Sterot, which is obviously very aware of the power of film and the power of storytelling. I would love to hear from you and and have you tell us what your project is trying to accomplish and how will you know when you've gotten there? Um, And I know you're going to walk us through some of it and have a chance for us to look at some of the images. You know, coming as, as a producer, as a filmmaker, coming from Israel, and I know this from colleagues from Palestinian filmmakers, we go around and we pitch projects, and usually the first sentence that we hear is, no, not another project about the conflict. And then, you know, we come back half a year later and we find some beautiful love story, and then the first sentence is, okay, but what about the conflict? <laughs> so this, this is kind of this schizo dichotomy that we live in. And, and what kind of brought Gaza uh, uh, um into life was let's do something that hasn't been done before, which sounds a little silly, but that was what we wanted to do. Not a documentary, as good as it may be, that is seen one day in Amsterdam and one day in Jordan and one day in Tel Aviv and one day on HBO, and never at the same time. And it obviously shows one side or the other side. So we tried to figure out a way of, and, and it actually popped up pretty quickly, and this uh, moved very quickly. Let's, for the first time, use the internet not only as an informative tool, but as a storytelling tool and as a tool. And I think uh, I was very moved when I heard what the Queen said uh, before of people looking at one another, people seeing one another, which in my mind and the opposite of the dehumanization, which I know from our area is so central to both sides. And that's really what brought it to life. And how has the response been thus far to Gaza Sderot? Well, Gaza Sderot had a very interesting span because we started it, and we'll see it whenever, uh, whenever I present it. We started on November, October 26th. We had a budget of about 45 days to uh, run the show daily. We ended the last, the last day was um, December 23rd. Nobody told us, including my... Um, chief of staff, that 
the Israeli army is going to invade Gaza three days later. That was kept a secret from us. Um, and that obviously changed a lot of things. And um, but during the time that we were on the air, uh, I'll just say in two sentences, I'll walk through it later. The basic idea is we had seven characters from Gaza, seven characters from Sderot. We had a team and a production, uh, um, production facility and a production house in Gaza my production um, company in Tel Aviv and a production company in Paris, which was kind of <coughs> the center of the pyramid, uh, which we can explain later how this, how this can happen. How can Palestinians from Gaza and Israelis cooperate even if officially they don't cooperate? That was tricky. And basically, we have a story shot of one of the characters each day and uploaded on this uh, internet website from both sides. So basically the audience follows these uh, characters. Um, the audience meaning the audience in Israel and the audience in Palestine and the international audience. We follow these characters both on the website ne right next to the other for a period of three months. <coughs> we had huge amounts of talkbacks, uh, we had a very, very, very um, dynamic Facebook group. Uh, we had lots of discussions on our website uh, to tell you that all of the talkbacks and all of the uh, um, discussions were peace, love, and understanding. No. So, Ark, let's, let's make it real for people. Will you, uh, will you take us through and show sure. us some of the video? I think we're teed up. And this, this video will be streamed also to our online viewers, um, so hopefully everybody who is watching around the world will also be able to see the presentation that Arik's making. Okay. Basically, this is what you see when you, uh, is there a possible making it bigger, losing the top and bottom? I mean, can we lose the top? If we can. Yeah, can people see oh, it's okay. I've got it. We're fine. We're fine. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Okay. Uh, this is basically the, 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 what you see here, and this is the basic conflict. We have two cities. Two cities that, in my mind, when, when this idea started, two cities which epitomized more than any other, um, it, definitely at that time, the, 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 the current, what ha what's happening right now in, in between Israel and Palestine, that's Gaza and Sderot, two kilometers apart, three kilometers apart, two videos a day. So basically, when you enter, when you enter the website, um, what you see here are two players. On the left, could I have sound, please? On the left, we have um, the film from Gaza. And on the right here, we have the film from Sderot. This was really the basic concept and the basic thing that we were trying to say. We, thank you. Just give me a second. Okay. Um, the idea is to have both sides on screen all the time. And you will see as we go along that this kind of, uh, this kind of, 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 of idea um, reflects itself in, in, in different areas or different um, sections of this website. Um, the middle here, as you can see, the middle here is basically the border. Or let's put it this way, a virtual border. But it also serves as a timeline. Each, little, each one of these orange dots is, um, uh, is, a, is a date. And on that date, we have two episodes, one for coming from Gaza and one coming from Sderot. Let's wait for the sound. Do we? No sound? Um, until we have sound, I'll just continue. It was very important for us to have, obviously, as many languages as possible. We developed something which is kind of a 
um, a nice application which the viewer can choose the language. We have this in um, Arabic, German, English, French, and Hebrew. So it was very important for us, obviously, although this was financed mostly by French money, that it would be, first of all, in Hebrew and Arabic, so people from the area can see what, um, can understand the, do we? Do we have? Do we have audio? Do what? Switch computers, okay. So maybe in the meantime, Eric, I can ask you a question, which okay. is that I know you as a documentary filmmaker um, who's been making films for broadcast on, on television around the world. Why was this format, why did you choose this format? And, I, and I'm specifically interested in the question of uh, interactivity and listening, which were mm -hmm. the themes of this morning. What does that do that is different? Okay. Because, you know, it, to some mind, documentary is already a listening format. It is already a different format, but yet this is one step further. And maybe tell us a little bit about the thinking okay. that is behind this. First of all, filmmaking is telling stories. And as far as I'm concerned, to tell a story of in two minutes or to tell a story in a telenovela of 220 hours is it's still telling a story. And that's what, so that's the, the filmmaking part of it. Now, when you have a documentary, when, and it doesn't matter what your political views are, and it doesn't matter uh, what side you come from, you still, and I think that's your job, you judge. You make a judgment. And I think the most important thing in this website is that we, we said, guys, we are showing you seven characters, people not media people, not politicians, regular people from Gaza. I'm mean, showing you seven people from Stilot. We're showing you what they're going through this. The, it's not a political, nobody's talking about politics, although obviously the conflict and everything has to do with the politics come. The curfew, the bombing, the shelling, uh, are not having uh, food, etc., etc. That comes through in the stories. And the main thing is that we don't judge, we don't say, you know, people in Gaza have a much harder time than people in Sdod or vice versa. We don't get into that. That is not our job. And that is very important because when you see stories whoops, on the media and when you see stories in documentaries, there's always a point of view. And I think that the, 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 the main issue for us, as I said before, the main issue for us, and, we've, and, we, and we saw it. We saw it during the war when, you know, I was looking pretty hysterically, I must admit, for our crew. Where are they? And you know, we, do it, we did it messenger because there were no phone calls because the Israelis cut the, um, uh, cut the phone lines at some time. But the idea, the basic idea of let's watch one another. And I know from, from our crew, you know, we were a pretty big crew and we were in a little a college, based in a little college. The first thing people did in the morning was, hey, let's see what, they got, what these guys put on the air. So, it, it, and it was a daily thing. And the thing that, oh, this is interesting. I didn't know we have a character here, uh, a, a young woman, young girl who's about 17 who's studying communications. And I heard lots of things that, oh, this is interesting. I didn't know that Arabs in Gaza, you know, kind of condescending Arabs in Gaza study communication. And we have one of the guys who's studying in, a, in Gaza who's in a, in a really nice swimming pool set. Swimming pool. These guys have a swimming pool. So it's, it's, the, it's this, and, 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 and obviously the same, the same from the other way around. Oh, these Israeli guys. I mean, yeah, it's not nice to have you know a rocket, on, blown on your head. So, but this is something that 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 is the first that is the first thing, and that well, for me it was the main thing, and and it worked. The people began to see one another, and say, yeah, you know, their life, it's not that great. Are we up? Are, Are we, we up? up? Just, Great. Just gonna use this. So uh, the oh, yeah. audio line from the podium to the PA is on the fritz. So <laughs> we can move over to this computer. Ah, you want me to move that? Yeah. Okay. Apologies. Okay. Um, so what I wanted to show you is just uh, a small example. Uh, as I said, we go back to October 26th, just to give you maybe a couple examples of... Um, Yeah. 
you will see, even when we do a full screen, it is never really a full screen. Which is part of the idea is that we can't get rid of the other side. The other side is there. I'm sorry to cut them off, but since we have limited time, I'd just like you to... הייתי רוצה להיות זה שלא יודעים מאיפה הוא. למרות שמה שאני כותב ברור לגמרי. אני חי בשדרות, זו כותרת כזאת של מישהו שסובל מבעיה. These are the set of characters that we have from Gaza and the set of characters that we have from Sderot. Again, very important. We want it very mixed. We want it young and old. We want it uh, uh, women and men and very definitely not people who are, and I'm not, not saying this uh, condescendingly, but no politicians, no media people. Um, and um, We chose, and you know, the thing, the nice thing about the internet, and as I say this as a filmmaker, um, character doesn't work, you can change it. That's a great thing on the internet. <laughs> you don't have that once the film is on the air. Um, and in, uh, you know, we, we've seen, for example, we've seen Avi, and you can go into one of each, each of the characters, and you can see who he or she is, and you can see the films that have been shown already, and you can go, and see one of the films. Um, another uh, area which I think is very important for, because we are dealing with a geopolitical story, we excused ourselves and used some of uh, Google Maps. Um, the very interesting thing here, I mean, what, what you see here is each time we had a new story, we pinned it up. For example, we have uh, the Young Journalist Club, as I told you before, so you can see the little story. Um, and um, our friends from Gaza sometimes told us, well, when we give you the coordinates of the hospital, we're going to move it a little bit to the next. <laughs> and we totally understood. Um, and then the nice, the nice thing about these Google Maps is, and, and it's actually fascinating, is, is, is this is really the situation. I mean, if you take the, the map of Sderot and move to the left within, I don't know, 10 seconds you'll be in Gaza and vice versa, which just shows you the immensity of the, of, of, of I don't know, the ridiculousness of this whole situation. Um, another way of going through um, our topics, um, which is basically if people want to see Kassam rockets or people want to see curfews or people want to see agriculture, et cetera, et cetera, uh, there are ways of doing it. Um, we have, uh, obviously, we have a whole bunch of, um, uh, which is very important, uh, the whole area of our blogs, how people reacted, what did people say. We had people react every day specifically for the films. We had people react once a week on the weekend. What did they see during the week? Um, there were dialogues going on between Um, Palestinians and Israelis, as well as uh, lots of people from um, uh, mostly Europe, because it, this was a French-based production, so a lot of, most of our European audience came from France and Germany, but there was a very good uh, audience which built up in, um, in um, North America as well. And just to end with 
a little bit, we start with filmmaking, they end with filmmaking. We found out that the most uh, effective films are not necessarily the ones who talk about politics. Uh, and if we would have time later, I could show you an example. But the ones who deal with actually, who deal with humor. And that is something which I think is very important when we deal with it. And I think humor is something that connects people um, probably more than uh, any, other, any other element of storytelling. So thank you for this. All right, thank you, Aaron. I, I do urge you to spend some time going through this, going through Gaza Sterot, because it is, it is such a beautiful rendition of, of what is this trend which storytelling. People are so hungry for real stories. And while it's absolutely true that people continue to go see Hollywood movies and continue to watch you know, four hours of television a day, um, at the same time, they're increasingly dubious of those kind of um, those voices, those consolidated voices, and are looking for independent, authentic, real, incredible voices. And this is what the power of the, of the new media tools is enabling us to do. And I think that Lucas Welch from Celia is a perfect person to talk about that because his whole platform is about encouraging real people <coughs> to connect. And so we'd love to talk to Lucas about, about how these new platforms enable new forms of dialogue and possibly of conflict resolution, please. Well, and, and I do, I think it's worth acknowledging that I, I come originally from a, a journalism background, mm -hmm. and I, I used to work at ABC News and, and spent um, about three years in the Middle East, particularly in Israel-Palestine, covering the, the, the conflict there. And, um, and I, I, I find the stories that are telling really profound um, and resonate very much with the work we do. But in one, one, one particular incident, when I was in Gaza in 2000, I was, I was walking through Han Yunus refugee camp, which um, is uh, um, in the south part of Gaza. And as anyone who's experienced Palestinian culture, the, the people there are very hospitable, and they invite you in. And, and I was invited into someone's home um, to share a meal with them. And uh, at the very beginning of the meal, um, someone, the, the, the sort of host of the, the family, said to me, he asked me, you know, where, where are you from? And I said, well, I'm, I'm from New York. And uh, his reaction was, isn't that dangerous? <laughs> you know, this guy had been watching all these movies, Mike, <laughs> and now thinks that, that New York is the most dangerous place on the planet. So, um, so just to illustrate the degree to which we are affected by what we see on the media. And um, one of the things I was struck by in my experiences there was the degree to which those personal interactions, and this really, I think, resonates with Rebecca's research, had a profound influence on my vision and, and view of the conflict there, much more than the facts and figures that I was exposed to. It's those personal relationships. And I was also very conscious of the, the transformation we're seeing in the sort of media infrastructure, that it is less and less about content and more about conversation. And, and this presents a real profound opportunity, I think. Um, and so after September 11th, I, I, I left ABC very intent on looking at how we could harness the potential of this conversation to enable more constructive exchange between the West and predominantly Muslim societies. And so I, I'd like to talk to what I see as two of the real critical challenges that aren't, I think, looked at enough in this context. Um, the first is the role of, of process. Um, we need to understand that technology is value agnostic. A, a open source chat room doesn't care whether it's used by the ACLU or Al Qaeda. And, and anyone who's experienced um, the chat rooms on the Washington Post knows that very often they do more harm than good. Um, and so just because people can connect doesn't mean they're going to be very nice to each other. And so we need to think about how we can create opportunities and experiences that enable us to empathize with the other, mm -hmm. to actually you know, connect in a way that allows us to see our common humanity mm -hmm. and to do so in a sustainable way. I thought one of the really interesting aspects of what Rebecca's research was that you know, it lasted 20 minutes, but then two weeks later those, the, that impact is gone. So how do we do it in a way that really lasts? So that's one question I think we really need to address is the role of process. The other is scale. Um, I think it's very, we all know what scale is in the broadcast era. It's about finding the biggest megaphone and touching as many people as you can to get your content out. But what is scale in the era of the networked area when we're talking about a conversation? It's a, it's a, it's a much more nuanced and I think complicated um, system. And so 
just you know, briefly on each of those two points. In, in terms of process, um, I think, again, some of this research is great to see. It really, it really you know, frankly, validates. I wish we'd got it six years ago. We've had to kind of learn a lot of this stuff through a lot of trial and, and error. Um, but the role of emotion is critical. We really need to acknowledge that the really profound shifts come when people are able to empathize emotionally with the viewpoints of others. And so one of the exercises that we do in our online dialogue, and just you know, two sentence overview of what we do, we have a cross-cultural education program where university students communicate through a web-based video conferencing application in small facilitated dialogue groups over the period of a semester with facilitators talking about these issues and creating media together. And so um, the first exercise we do is we empower students to tell stories about their identity. Um, and I think, it, you know, I, I think the work Art's done is, is brilliant. I think it really, there's a lot of resonance between that, is allowing people to tell their stories. It gets at this notion of empowerment, you know, the, 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 how important it is for people to be heard. And it's another issue that I'd love to see Rebecca and, and the other folks do some research on is, is the power of story. And I'm sure Riz can talk to, you know, whenever you have an issue, if you, it doesn't matter if you're talking about, you know, the new settlement policy, you're not going to go and find a clause in the document. You're going to find a character. Who's the character that's going to enable this story to be told? So, so those two elements are really critical, I think, that we acknowledge as being a key part of any process we set up. So, so and what we found is that really shifts the dynamic. If you, if you enable people to tell their stories about their identities and then have a conversation about settlement policy, it's a much different and much more constructive conversation. In terms of scale, I think it's important that we recognize that the infrastructure in this next era it's not about transmission towers. It's not about satellite dishes. And it's not even about routers. It's about people. Um, and this is really a wonderful thing in some ways and kind of scary in another way. Um, because everyone now can be a mini broadcasting outlet, I, I can, any video or text I see, I can share with all of you instantly and perfectly. That's incredible. That means that the way in which we get information is, is shifting away from our media networks and more to our social networks. And, and so in some ways, that's really empowering. It's for those of us who you know, want to give it to the man, that's kind of you know, compelling. But for those of us who also feel that wisdom derives from the multiplicity of viewpoints, it's a bit worrisome, because our social networks are not exactly cross-sections of the world's population. Mm -hmm. And it enables us to really reinforce our pre-existing you know, perceptions. So these are major challenges, and I, I do think that as much of an evangelist of technology as I am, I think without addressing these challenges, the trend lines are very worrisome. Um, at Solia, what, what we aim to do, you know, we've been doing this Connect program over the last six years. We now have about 2,000 young people around the world who have gone through this program, many of them thanks to Cynthia Schneider. Um, and um, we're now looking to empower that community to really serve as um, to serve as in, in two functions. One, we want them to play a role as sort of curating the world's information. <laughs> you know, because our social networks can serve as a filter to enable sort of the best content to bubble up to the top, we want to create a community that is a more balanced social filter so that, you know, the various viewpoints on different issues are able to be respected and acknowledged and come up to the top. And then the second is, how do you get those viewpoints out to the world? And again, I think that the infrastructure of an effective distribution system today is more about a community. It's much more akin to community organizing than it is to you know, finding the right bully pulpit. And so we're looking to empower that community of young adults with the right tools, the right training, and the right experience. I think and another comment Rebecca made that I, I like very much is being able to listen, being able to understand. We take that for granted. It's a learned skill. And so you need the training to really empathize and really understand and then be able to translate that story into your own community. So that, that's, that's our approach to, to a lot of these challenges. And I think they're, they're important ones for us to be thinking about. Absolutely. Thank you. I think that is just such a, such a key point. It seems like you guys are really systematically trying to expand people's social networks yeah. so that the idea that all politics is local, is, is all media is local, and, cr and expanding what that local social network system looks like. Because if, if indeed, you know, the world is in fact getting smaller, and in the face of so much choice, we're just going to the, to the channels that, we, that reinforce what we already believe, mm -hmm. or the websites that already, 
you know, reinforce what we believe, then in fact the media is not doing its job and, and public media needs to do more to, to really be a tool of education. Um, and we need to find ways to, to build on the trust that people feel when they're in a safe environment with people who think like us and, and, and look like us, but how do, we, how do we break through? And obviously media is a key part of that strategy. Well, I'm really sensitive to the fact that I came into this panel saying there's going to be so much time for questions and interaction, and I do want to turn it over to this, to this, to this esteemed audience and our online audience. And before I do that, I just wanted to give these excellent panelists a chance to respond to anything that any of you have said. If there's any anything that you want to pick up or make sure is underscored, I think there have been some very, very powerful points made. Anything, Mike or Riz or just a quick comment. I think Eric's project is absolutely brilliant because um, it, it really takes. Uh, interaction to a new level, and it takes uh, storytelling to a new level. So really, congratulations on that. Uh, you made an interesting point about um, what is effectively the view, a view I have, that people watch with baggage. They always come with baggage. And so when people say to me, uh, you know, how is it working for Al Jazeera, I used to have the same question with CNN and the BBC. And, and in the same way, I always had to defend the BBC as being British imperialistic and so on, and CNN being American uh, government agenda, and Al Jazeera being, you know, so and so. Um, so the the issue is people when they watch they always want to watch something that they feel validates their views their perspective so people tend to watch channels they feel uh, reflect what they what they think which is why Fox has an audience that's a particular kind I mean if if Bill O'Reilly annoys you you're not going to watch him every day you might watch him just to, to find out what he's saying but it's not the kind of thing that you will tune into and say yes I agree so I always remind people that when they switch on or, or listen on the radio or even read a magazine or newspaper they're coming from a perspective. It's, it's very rare that you'd have someone in the middle of the road saying, OK, I see this and I see this. It's very hard to get people to think that way. But I think your project's quite unique in that way. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, now I would love to turn it over to the audience. I'll take a few questions, and then we'll go, Joel, to some online folks. I'll take two questions from here, and then we'll go to two questions from our online group. Can I hear the lady in the back? Thank you. Uh, my name is Maria Stavropoulou. And, um, Brace yourself, it's a long title. I'm a political affairs officer in the office of the special advisor to the UN Secretary General on the prevention of genocide. And I um, have a question, and that is, um, what research is being done or work, what work is being put into the impact of media, entertainment, new technologies on children um, for two re obvious reasons. One is that this is such a formative age and stage in life for mentalities, for the us and them constructs, for or against conflict and so forth, and also because um, media just has so much more impact today than it had on children 10, 20, 30 years ago. Thank you. Did you have an answer to that, sir? Did you want to respond? Is there somebody on the panel who wants to respond? Shamal. Shamal? Yeah. Yes. Well, I, I mentioned Alan the script consultant for Bill Cosby. He's actually the chair. I'm actually trying to look it up in my contact book right now because it's a center in uh, at Harvard that studies exactly media's impact. It's the Judge Baker Children's Center, and they focus on media's impact on children. I'd be happy to connect you. And he would probably know many, many more people that I don't. So that would be a good starting place. Over here. Hi, my name is Aya Sehati. I'm a businesswoman, but very much interested in this uh, area. Um, something that troubles me as a Saudi Muslim woman, of course, um, is um, when I watch the news, any channel, not only Fox, I see that when um, speakers are tackling terrorism or anything that is remotely or not so remotely pertaining to the Middle East, the background that the producers um, uh, put the images are of mosques, of people um, uh, engaged in, in Muslim prayer. And I find that very troublesome that in you know the largest outlets, news outlets, this is happening, whether it's commentators or also just simple you know, straight reporting. And I'd like to know why, um, well, doesn't seem like there is much being done to tackle that straight. And um, so if there is, what is it? And how far, are, how far advanced are we in uh, addressing uh, this? Just from a TV perspective, I, the trouble is that there's less and less education, um, less and less training for journalists. Um, I went through a two-year program with the BBC, and, and it was pretty harsh. Uh, you know, there, there was no 
there was no leeway. We were, we were really questioning everything we did, everything we said. So it was real, really good training. That's far less common nowadays. And so journalists end up in, in fairly responsible positions without having been exposed to some of the, the potential pitfalls. Uh, and it's very easy to, to put a foot wrong. You know, I mean, apart from the typo I mentioned, eject and elect, uh, there are far more serious consequences. And people also come conditioned. I mean, this was actually not a journalist uh, story about a journalist, but uh, it was a journalist friend of mine who called me trying to, to manage a very uh, a difficult situation he'd come across. He'd left journalism, gone into a company. And I won't name the company, but a major defense manufacturer had decided to put out a, a, an advertising campaign for a new attack helicopter. And the image that someone had approved and went out before anyone could really question it was of this attack helicopter hovering over a mosque with the uh, troops, you know, uh, repelling, uh, uh, coming down on ropes onto the dome of the mosque. And it said, comes from the heavens and unleashes hell. Um, so, so there's a major issue. And no one actually stops to think, actually, this might be offensive. Um, so the trouble is that a lot of people come uh, without the kind of experience or training that they need to, to really be able to identify these kinds of things. So it, things often are done in a hurry. That's one issue. It's like if it's an image, if it's a story about Arabs, let's just grab the picture of the souk. Uh, if it's a story about, you know, um, uh, say, child soldiers always pick on, say, Sierra Leone or something like this. So it's a lack of sometimes resources, sometimes education, and sometimes time. I agree, but I think it's unacceptable it is, that uh, yeah. 1.5 million people are, um, you know, a direct... Uh, Tara, can, can I comment on this? Um, yes, absolutely. I, I, th I, I totally agree, and I think that one of the powerful tools that new media, grassroots new media, and international global new media can do is exactly change this thing. Because what we are trying to do is we are trying to by bypass the networks, all of the networks. And we're trying to bypass the images which are shown on at least some of these networks. Yeah. There are creative solutions and new solutions, but I think also we need to tackle the cla Well, basically, I'm asking people who can help to please do tackle the classic solution of addressing the training, the quality of training, especially it's not a simple topic or, you know, a one-time uh, one story. It is a, an, an ongoing, unfolding um, story that, uh, you know, uh, uh, contains many societies and I, I don't know if there's, just a quick comment, I don't know if there is a solution. The problem is that um, the quality of management in the broadcasting media has, has gone downhill <laughs> because the people who climb up are those who um, often don't have the uh, commensurate in, um, level of uh, experience and they're just pushed up because they, they survive the duration of the job. Um, there is less uh, money being spent on training which allows people to get the kind of education that they need to, to help them understand what the jobs? Are. I don't see an easy. I mean, it's. I, I understand the need for the solution, but I, I, I'm, I'm sort of pessimistic. It's. Uh, it's no, not going to get better. Or, or I mean, you have to qu yeah. question every time. People don't question. There's not a lot of accountability, and I think that's what's needed. Um, we're going to take a question from online. Uh, great. Yeah. Continuing discussion, I'll. I'll maybe uh, share two questions that open up some additional uh, threads uh, beyond what's been discussed. Uh, there's a robust conversation around the role of profit and the incentives that that creates for media organizations, both entertainment, news, and independent media. Uh, Priyanka and Gail have been going back and forth around that issue in particular, uh, discussing how can we get news media producers to find it lucrative and useful enough to actually modify their productions, as has been discussed, stereotypes power some well-built monetary machines. And the other issue is around how um, this can be beneficial. We can take these insights to affect how we educate kids using media. Um, and uh, Christy posed a good question. The need to educate youth early on about global diversity is crucial. How can we apply these lessons to that? Great. I'd love to. Uh, Mike, can you hear us over there? I can. Yeah. I mean, I had, a, I had a couple of comments, actually, I'd like to make. First of all, um, it's all profit at this point, in every, at every level, every media. It's, uh, you know, I had a conversation with Anderson Cooper one day. He was telling me that, uh, you know, they're monitoring almost every second of uh, how many people are watching his show, including the commercials. So if people basically, like myself, who have TiVo, who can actually TiVo the program and then just skip the uh, commercial, you know, it's... Um, you know, it's pretty clear 
what it's about. It, and I don't, I don't believe that there's any fair and balanced news <coughs> service anywhere. I mean, I think everybody comes to it with some sort of uh, a degree of, of um, uh, you know, of, of, uh, of unfairness. Uh, I, I think that the, you know, documentaries are probably the best form to get, but even they, I think, become unfair and balanced at, at, in, in, a, in a lot of places. So um, I, I, I'm not sure I lost, I may, I may have lost the question, but if, if I haven't answered it, then ask it again. Yeah, and Luca, Lucas on our panel would like to direct a, a comment and a, something back to Mike. I was actually going to add in to the two questions in oh, terms great. of the, um, so I, I mean, first of all, I think I, I like that it was not just profit, but also incentives in the question. And I, I think looking at the way in which, you know, a huge portion of the media we're exposed to now is oftentimes user generated um, and um, without, you know, commercial interest in mind. Uh, I think that, again, I, I, I feel that we need to look at community organizing as a model for how content gets out increasingly. You look at why Barack Hussein Obama is in the White House, a big part of that is because there were a lot of young people around the country who volunteered their time, got out, knocked on doors, used their Facebook profiles, and changed the world. And, and I think that for them, the incentive structure was much more about affiliation. It was being a part of something, um, the social dynamics around that. It was about reinforcing a narrative they had about themselves, who they are as a person. And so I think we need to expand the, the conversation around what incentives are. It's not just money. Maybe for the corporations it is, but, but if we're taking a holistic approach to this, we need to expand that conversation. And then one other thing to the second question about educating kids, um, I do think that it's a lot harder today to make sense of the world. You're exposed to so many different you know, pieces of information and ways of interpreting what's happening. We really need to focus more on media literacy and, and educating young people about how to critically access the content they're exposed to. And one way in which I think to do that is to just provide people tools to make it themselves. You know, as our part of our program, one exercise we do is we provide students with raw footage from Al Jazeera and from AP about a particular issue. We then teach them how to create a short news segment with that footage. Ahmed in Cairo has the exact same footage as Jennifer does at Georgetown. They tell very different stories. And then they talk about, well, why did you, you know, just use the clips from the press conference and not any of the people on the street? You know, and so getting people to think about those issues is really important at an early age. I would just like it, to, it, it, you know, uh, I wanted to make one point, and that is, in you know, in Hollywood, it's all about making money, mm -hmm. and I agree that, that the issue of community becomes a very important part of um, you know Hollywood at this point. I mean, they figured out, as a matter of fact, that you know this is how they're going to make money. They're going to create communities that will buy their products. And educating in Hollywood is a very difficult, very difficult area. But, uh, you know, one of the proposals that I made a, in the book is that we create a kind of council of foreign relations here in, in Hollywood and that we have people come out and really uh, instruct uh, the Hollywood filmmakers as to how they could go about making films that not only entertain, uh, but also educate. One of the things that I, I think is really funny is that after uh, Inconvenient Truth, you know, participant films thought every documentary they made was going to be as successful as an Inconvenient Truth, and they've been, you know, sadly mistaken. Uh, and welcome to the world of, you know, the slog and the financial uh, limitations and restrictions for documentary filmmakers. But I think as there has been, you know, the year of the documentary every year for the last seven years, um, in Fahrenheit 9/11, and kind of, you know, the the increased. Uh, centrality of documentary, um, those kind, you know, I think Hollywood is taking notice of getting behind more social issue kinds of films and putting some of the weight of those resources behind them. You know, Tamara, one of the issues uh, with uh, Slumdog Millionaire was interesting because those who've been to India and seen the situation on the ground in India know what slums are like, um, looked at this film and thought, well, you know, what's your point? You know, and uh, the people who actually were they sing, yeah. well. I mean, the thing is, yeah, apart from singing in the slums, uh, apart from um, apart from uh, you know, the, you know, I mean, obviously it was a very you know story, dramatic story, and so on, well, well executed. But but essentially, you know, f as a sort of uh, social topic for for the average person who's seen the real world and and seen slums, there was nothing dramatic about that. It was a love story, basically. Mm -hmm. um, for the Western world that hadn't been exposed to the slums, this was a oh my god, people actually live like this. And it was an awareness, um, you know, it was an education. 
So I think it's kind of interesting. It's, it comes down again to education and perspective. And, and for me, very, it, the sad thing about living in America, which is essentially one of the most uh, sort of kind and giving countries when you meet the people, the politics and the people are, you know, in every country are different. But the, the country has a bad image. It's a shame. The people are really quite generous and kind-hearted and open-minded, but they don't get exposed uh, from an early age to what the world is about. They don't get to see you know, that there are kids living in slums. They don't get to see that, uh, you know, 90, 99% of the world doesn't live in these nice, neat uh, subdivisions. And that, that's, a, that's a key thing. I went with a producer from CNN to, to India, and we had to film in a slum. And very quickly, she was like, we have to leave. We have to, oh, I said, we just got here. She said, but it smells. And I said, I'm sorry, but <laughs> this is how the world smells. This is not, it's not, you know, Marietta, Georgia, uh, like, like your home. So um, you know, it's, it, there's an awareness needed, even among people who travel. Well, with the new broadcast, we'll have a smell vision and that will uh, be a problem. Yeah. But, but I think, you know, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Fareed Zakharia's idea concept of the rise of the rest. There also may be Hollywood or media makers sort of following the trend of really telling stories about the rest of the world. Stories like Slumdog Millionaire, I think, that have a commercial angle for sure mm -hmm. and are a love story, but have a very different, are set in a very different context and environment. I know there was yeah, and going, going to that point, you know, one of the points in the book is that everybody wants to tell their own story. I mean, I, I don't, I think it's not only Hollywood wanting to tell a story. It's, you know, every nation now feels the need to tell their own story. Their own people want to tell their own story. And that, of course, is healthy because then everybody will, you know, can judge for themselves as to whether this is true or whether this is not reality. Great point. We have a lot of excited hands in the audience, sir. You've been waiting patiently. Thank you. Morad Ekbal, formerly at the Center for International and Comparative Law at the University of Baltimore. I have two questions. Uh, the first one goes to what Mr. Khan talked about, uh, about the image of um, uh, Bill Cosby's son being murdered and how do you choose the frame and all that sort of thing. Uh, the question I have is, uh, how how does one judge or evaluate what exact frame to use? Uh, I'm particularly troubled by the fact that both Gulf Wars have been very sanitized, whereas if you go back to the Vietnam War, every twist and turn of the military was covered and the public was very much aware of what was happening. The second question I have, it goes to Mr. Medavoy and uh, uh, Mr. Um, Bernstein, and that is uh, when we talk about communication and content, the implicit presupposition is that there has to be some kind of action. And the beauty of what you've presented, Eric, on, on the screen is that I have control to pause in the image and I can just sit there and look at the image, freeze frame it for a period of time and look at it and study it and then move on to the next one. Whereas in the context of commercial films, Mr. Medavoy, you don't have that option. You're sitting in a theater, you're confined by the two hours or more that the producer has put on the screen. And I'd like for the two of you to speak about these two points. Thank you very much. I can quickly address the issue of the, the images in the Gulf War. It's interesting because um, uh, just before Al Jazeera launched, I, I spent a few days with Colin Powell, who I like very much, um, out in Asia, and we had some time together. I was having lunch with him, and you know, he'd asked me what I was doing since I left CNN, and I said, I'm helping to start Al Jazeera English, which raised his eyebrows. Um, but, um, but it's interesting because he said, you know, look, Al Jazeera was the darling of the U.S. government when it launched in 96 as the Arabic yeah. channel because, of course, it was doing something the U.S. wanted, democratic television in the Middle East. Um, this is how it, it saw it. He said the problem came when uh, the U.S. went into Afghanistan in 2001, uh, at, uh, yeah, in two after September the 11th in 2001, and suddenly, you know, the, the media was showing, or Al Jazeera was showing civilian casualties, collateral damage. I said, look, the media was basically doing its job, but, but the fact that they weren't embedded or they weren't controlled is where America... Uh, started to, you know, have an issue with Al Jazeera and Donald Rumsfeld in particular. And, and it's ironic because, you know, he would always say it shows beheadings. Al Jazeera has never shown a beheading. You know, it's, 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 and actually a few newspapers and magazines have had to apologize, having, you know, quoted this. But the thing is that um, the, the whole concept of embedding was access. I mean, as military uh, or uh, theater of war gets more and more confined and more and more advanced, um, it's uh, embedding is often a route for journalists to get access when they might not have it, and and you know, obviously some are willing to compromise or some are willing to accept the conditions. But there is also a, a problem with embedding in that people become emotionally attached to the people they're embedded with, and that of course then skews the story, potentially skews the story. Um, and so embedding as a concept changes the way wars are covered. 
Uh, and I think that's one of the issues, I mean, when you talk about how, how, they're, how they're addressed. And, th and then it's, again, it, you know, it's perspective. I always tell the story of um, a woman who was attacked by a dog in Central Park, an elderly lady. And uh, as, she was, uh, as she was being attacked, this, this young man saw the dog attack and he chewed off the dog and he scared the dog away. And this uh, local newspaper reporter in New York heard about this and he, s he went and found the guy. And he said, uh, this is great. I can see the headline in the paper now. Local boy saves elderly woman from dog attack. And the guy says, actually, I I'm, not, I'm not a local boy. I don't come from New York. He says, oh, don't worry. I see the headline now. American hero saves pensioner from dog attack. He said, I'm, I'm actually not American. I'm, I'm from the Middle East. I'm studying here. <laughs> Next day, it said, local dog attacked by Arab terrorist. <laughs> and so, so the concept and the perception <laughs> or the perspective can change. Uh, did you want me to answer that question? I mean, first of all, I guess we're, I guess I'm not on. Yes, you're on. You're on. Oh, OK, OK, saying. very good. Gotcha. I mean, the issue, the issue of content in, in uh, fictional film, uh, you know, most of the time you know what you're going to see. I mean, you, you'll probably, by, by the time you go see something, you'll have read the reviews, you'll have seen a lot of people talk about it. Or you'll have that first instinct, which is to go to movies, which, you know, is, you, know you go to every movie. Um, as, as far as violence is concerned, for example, which is one of the things that bothers people, um, I, I remember Sam Peckinpah making movies early on in his career where everybody was getting killed, and there was a lot of blood coming out of, you know, a lot of blood spurts coming out all over the place. And he was roundly criticized for doing this violence. That, of course... Sam's argument for this was, you know, I'd rather show it the way it is so that people can really know, you know, the effect of violence than sugarcoat it, which is the way it used to be done in the 40s and in early 50s. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's in the eyes of the beholder. If you, you know, if you're bothered by violence, I would suggest that you learn about the film that you see before you go see it. Now, it's the, the content to children you know there there's a ratings process in in, in hollywood which just which tells you more or less what sort of film you can see i think Eric, there's a question about the limitations of yeah i i think I, I think the question is not new media versus film i think one of you know we're talking about storytelling and i think what new media is giving us and has been giving us for the last, I don't know, not that long, and will definitely evolve, is just a new way of telling a story. I don't think it will replace, uh, I hope not. But I, I mean, think our- I'll still like you, but, yes, Google? Yeah, I was just gonna say, but, but it's beyond story. If we go back to the research of this morning, mm -hmm. it's who the story's about, no, no, exactly, who's telling but the story, it's, how it's, the story's told, what I'm, is implied, right? I'm getting there, because when I'm saying, you know, a new way of storytelling, it's not just what the story is. It's, as you said, it's the involvement of the audience, of the user, of the people who sees it, of being able to share uh, uh, your story with 10, 10,000, 10 million other people at the same time. And the, and the, the, the most important thing is the, the, the ability for, for us, uh, for us, I'm talking about this whole crowd here, is to um, use these kind of storytelling so people will be able to do something with it. And I think that, that is maybe the most important thing. Uh, and, I'm, and it's still very much uh, virgin land. I mean, we're still searching. Just the one, one sentence comment. I mean, I think it is, it, it's important that we don't just think of new media as, as an alternative distribution system. It is a more fundamental change in the mm -hmm. sense that it's, it's a conversation. It, it's not just about getting your story out to a different audience. It's about engaging the conversation, which is, great because the research shows we need to listen more. But the question is if Hollywood, and Mike this is what you're saying, if Hollywood is getting savvy to the fact that everybody now is expecting to have their social networks built around their favorite programs and you've got Hulu and distributing 24 and all of this, how are, you know, if we have commercial, commercially sponsored social networks, is that helping move us to this place of the research which is that, you know, is that still listening, is that still the same kind of interactivity or are people looking for more independent credible non-commercial ways to do that and make those connections. There are comments in the audience. Yes.
Thank you. I'm Diane Perlman with the Institute for Conflict Analysis and Resolution at George Mason. Um, anyway, thank you very much for your work, but a, a lot of the work is done among the intelligentsia, students, and you know, more highly cultured people, and that um, say there's a class of people who are, say, less educated, more vulnerable to patriarchal, authoritarian domination, psychological manipulation, um, say that have more, you know, stronger enemy images. So um, wondering what your thoughts are about designing both content and getting message across um, more carefully. You know, we even see that in our own country with all the hysteria about Obama um, that gets a lot of play. So I'd like you. Okay, so is your question, how, basically kind of with the findings of the research that, that groups are sensitive to seeing, so that, that the less dominant groups seeing stereotypes about themselves? Is your question how as media makers will that will be changed or what is what is well, the question? Most of the work is done among you know also like there are student exchanges but they're not like say exchanges of say worker people who are less mm -hmm. educated and that I think we you know some of the um, more intensity of the problems are rising up from that group and they also feel very threatened humiliated uh, losing power mm -hmm. um, yes, so I think we sure need different yeah. kinds of ways to reach strategies and techniques and yeah, kinds. Do you have a I, yeah, I'd love, I mean, it's, it's, it's a huge question for us. You know, I mean, in the early stages of our work, frankly, it's, it's a lot easier for us to get partnerships at, you know, Georgetown universities and the American universities in Cairo and the American universities of Beirut. It's just easier, you know, but to get the partnerships with the Hebron universities and the Cairo, Cairo universities is much more challenging. And even then, you can definitely make the case we're you know, those are not necessarily representative of their broader societies either. You know, these are people who are going to college. These are people at this stage who have some level of, of English, you know, ability to speak English. These, these are huge concerns, you know, and we need to be very honest about them. At the same time, I, I, I do think that, again, this is sort of thinking about, I think we need to be strategic at this moment. Hopefully in 10 years we will have machine translation that, that works seamlessly. Right now it's, it's incredible how quickly it's developing, but it's still really problematic. You know, but it hopefully in 10 years that will, you know, make us, you know, be a game changer. For now, I think we need to look at these landscapes and see that, okay, in Hebron, for instance, we work with Hebron University. I've been to the campus many times. And these are not the elites, you know. And there are, there are women in these classes who have spent the last 15 years of their lives studying every day to learn English so that they can have an interaction with someone who's not in the walls in which they live. You know, these are people who not only have not left, you know, Palestine, they've not left Hebron. And so for them, you know, to have an opportunity via $500 computer to actually interact with people, and it's not perfect, they struggle with the language, but it's incredibly empowering for them, for them to be able to then be heard. And then we have to think of them as the intercultural translators. These are the people who we need to empower and inspire to go into their communities and extend the dialogue. And they're the translators. They're the ones who help us amplify that. So I think we need to be strategic at this moment. It's, it's not a perfect solution. It's going to be messy for a while. But I think too often we think of this in the broadcast model of like, we need to touch you know, millions of people. I think we need to touch thousands of people and empower them to touch millions of people. And so. Thank you, Lucas. And Joel, I'd just like to hear, are we having any other comments or feedback from our international viewers? Yeah, absolutely. The conversation is, is still ongoing. Um, <laughs> I'll maybe pose a, a question for Riz Khan um, on the potential of broadcast media meeting interactive media as a way to really facilitate this kind of engagement. Um, and anyone who watches your show knows that Al Jazeera English is as good as any news channel at bringing the audience in. Um, Jess asks, what kinds of processes foster constructive dialogue and which don't direct it properly? What's been Al Jazeera's experience with interaction? Well, it's inter you know, back in 1996 when I launched Q&A on CNN, it was the first interactive global show where we took emails, we took, we asked for video mails, we actually got one little cafe in Jerusalem that would send us video mails. We, and I actually <laughs> went to visit them <laughs> because I was so happy. Um, <laughs> they, uh, video mails, I don't know why, for some reason, they have a problem. Yeah, you think people want to see themselves on TV. But anyway, um, the, it, was, it surprised me that even in that time, I mean, uh, 13 years, it's still, and the show I do on Al Jazeera, which is the same thing, it's interactive. Now we're using Facebook more, we're using Twitter, um, we're far more interactive in that way, but it's still, um, it's still rare for people to get access to the media, the mainstream media, 
it's available, but they don't they don't do it as much. And and the media only has slots, such as my program, they're getting a little better in, in inviting comments and stuff. But um, traditional media, I think, it's largely again because of the, the culture of the management and and to some degree generational uh, issues, um, has has still kept a dividing line between online and uh, on air. And I think this is something that has to be addressed because the online community, Al Jazeera English is available now in DC, thank goodness, um, and uh, around some, some parts of the US, but it's still very limited access in the mainstream distribution, on the mainstream distribution platforms in the US. And yet we have a huge audience online, um, watching us online. And it, it, to me, emphasizes how important the online community is. That's to say, it's, it's actually not just an online community, it is the community. And, um, it also is a younger community, and broadcasters are desperately fighting for younger audiences. I remember one time CNN did research that showed that their average viewer was 67 or something. So, I mean, if you, unless you're going to do adverts for, uh, you know, flatulence tablets and, and teeth denture fixture and stuff, you know, it's, here's a young audience that you can actually uh, touch commercially, too, if, if that's the concern. We don't have that concern. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> it just came to mind. <laughs> Media, hot air, you know, anyway. Um, so the thing is that... Um, the thing is that you know it's it's uh, we don't have a commercial concern right now. I think we may do down the road, but uh, it's something that people have to think about: who's being touched out there? If there's going to be um, a commercial element that's keeping the channel on air, I think that that line between on air and online has to go. Well, there has been a woman waiting very patiently. This will be our last question, and then we'll have time for just some final final comments and and then out. Yeah, the woman in the back. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. Tommy Udom. I've done some work with both the American mainstream media and the Arab media. Um, uh, most specifically, of course, Al Jazeera. Um, but one thing that I've seen the U.S. government make a mistake in, which I see the mainstream U.S. media making a mistake, is they don't have enough experts in the field. So let's talk about the Middle East. Where are those Arab American and Muslim American mainstream commentators or on-the-air personalities? You know, we've got Hoda Kotb, NBC News, who does a 10 o'clock Today Show bit. And then, of course, Fareed Zakariah and the wealth of knowledge he brings because of where he's come from and who he is. Um, Hollywood has the same problem. We've got, you know, Tom Shadiak, who's a great Hollywood producer and does funny movies, but none of them really focus on the issues of the Arab and Muslim world, which I think one of the previous questioners was getting at. We're never going to win this stereotype problem until we have people who really understand the culture, the language, the knowledge of that region on mainstream media, not only as commentators, but embedded, if you will, within those particular media outlets. I'm wondering what you know the, the panel has to say about that. Well, uh, can I comment on that just for Please a second? Please, Mike, go ahead. You know, Hollywood, uh, you brought up Hollywood. I mean, I would agree with you. Uh, several years ago, and I'd say probably 20 years ago, I said to an audience of Mexican American in, in Washington, well, I think that's a great that's a great uh, plug for the Alliance of Media Civilizations. And with that, I would love to just give the final word. Uh, no, if she has anything, any final comment or question for this panel, from 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 Queen Noor. If there's any question or comment, I, 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 let me just make one comment. We've been having a back and forth here, with <laughs> Cynthia and I, simply about what you barely touched on, which is the fact of access. And and the mm -hmm. question from back there earlier was also about access. Mm -hmm. I think, and and. Because there are a number of issues I'm concerned about, it not only the Middle East, but also nuclear disarmament and proliferation, and I'm looking at how to reach the constituents of the political leaders that have to be moved, whether it's here or it's in the Middle East or it's in India and Pakistan or wherever it might be. And in, in looking at that, in each country, in each region, there are going to be different platforms, different, different uh, um, outlets, and the majority of people in most of these countries, not all of them, don't have access. And, the, and those are the ones that are actually the constituent populations of the political leaders. So th this is just something that one has to bear in mind as we have this discussion, which, which is that not even in all urban areas, or we, you were saying in, in at least in urban areas everywhere in the world, there is access possible for um, to to, to um, the internet, for example, but it's not being made use of by the vast majority of, of people. So that is something just to, to mm -hmm. hold, I think. And and then I, I think the last word should go to the panel. Um, I think the last word should go to the panel. That's for you. <laughs> Thank you again. 
I'd like to refer to, to, to um, this comment, very important comment by the Queen, but I think it's surprising to know that in most places in the world, um, you will find an internet cafe. True, it's definitely not, not as popular as, as, as you said, as we would like it to be. For example, on our project, we very specifically had the audience can choose between going broadband and going very simple. If, the, if they had a lousy connection in some remote wherever, they could go to an HTML, and we very purposely did that. So giving a, and we're also, we, we, didn't even, we didn't even begin to get into cellular, et cetera, et cetera, applications, uh -huh. which cellular in places like Africa changed, yeah. changed the world. I mean, we all know this, that in, in places that people never had a phone before, uh, suddenly they have cellular. And when cellular begins to, uh, when, when we get more advanced with, and, and you know, this is something that we just didn't have the time to get into, to how all these things and all this content we're talking about can go on cellular platforms, then you definitely can reach much, much, much larger audience than actually TV does. And Riz has one yep. more there's an, there, and exactly, there's, a, there's an opportunity with the generational shift. I mean, um, I remember I got my first computer years and years ago, and I was just terrified that I'd push a wrong button, the thing would blow up or something. <laughs> I, and, and this was just a, it was an adjustment. And, that, you know, I came, I'm, I'm of that age where everything just changed. You know, we, we got calculators at school, weren't allowed to use them for a couple of years, but we were, you know, they existed. Um, so, you know, our generation, if you like, or the generations that myself and beyond um, have, have been always scared to use technology. And I'm, I'm, I'm a gadget freak, so I've you know, adopted and adapted to as much as I can. But the thing is that uh, the young generation has a great opportunity. They're not scared of pushing buttons. They're not scared of uh, trying, getting access. There was an experiment in India called the Hole in the Wall Project, where in the slum they put a, a, a touchscreen computer and just left it there, powered up and everything else, connected to the internet. And they found kids who were going up there and just like experimenting with it. And within a few days, these kids were navigating the web in a different language, effectively. They learned what would do, and it would reset, of course, but they could push buttons, and they'd push buttons till they saw the cause and the effect, and, yeah. uh, and they were able to navigate it. And, and I think this is what's happening with uh, the media is, um, in many countries, leaders are not reading the signs. If they, they, don't, they try to control the media, it's going to change <coughs> underneath them. The, the foundations are going to crumble. People will have access somehow. They get around firewalls. They get around uh, uh, limitations to access and proxy servers. People will always be able to get around, especially the young generation that is more creative and willing to push buttons, and, and things will come from under them. I always talk about the, uh, an example of misreading the signs. There was a story of a trooper in Virginia who went on to Route 10 and saw a car driving along really slowly. And he like, looked, and he clocked it at 10 miles an hour. He thought, that's, that's dangerous. That's even worse than someone speeding since they're going so slowly on this, on this road. So he pulled the car over, and it was filled with elderly ladies, elderly lady at the wheel. And, and the ladies in the back looked terrified. They were like pale-faced and absolutely scared. So he said to the driver, what are you doing? She said, I, I wasn't speeding, officer. I was doing just the posted speed limit. He said, what do you mean? She said, I read the signs. It, th it said 10. He said, no, no, 10 is not the speed limit. That's the name of the road. It's Route 10. It's Route 10. It's not the speed limit. She, she was very embarrassed and said, I'm sorry. I, I misread the sign. Uh, he said, well, don't worry. I, I, I'm not going to give you a ticket. But I'm a bit worried about your passengers. They look very, well, they look very worried. She said, they'll be OK in a few minutes. We just got off Route 120. <laughs> so, so I think. I think it's important to read the signs correctly. <laughs> <laughs> and I know we're out of time, but Lucas, you, you just have Just briefly, a I mean, I do think the, the point that, that Her Majesty made is really central. I mean, I think we do need to um, be very honest about what are, who are we working with here. And, and I think that over the last 10 years, the primary constraint has been the technical um, access in the sense that there hasn't been infrastructure in place that's changing radically. I mean, we're not there yet, and it'll be a while before we're fully there. But, but as, as Arik said, there are, I mean, in most refugee camps now, there are multiple you know, web cafes. The challenge is the human capacity to use them. Do they have the skills? Do they know how to? Are there applications? I mean, just having you know, Internet Explorer doesn't mean that you're going to interact positively with the rest of the world. So I think we really need to be investing in the people, providing training, being creative about what technologies are right for what communities. I mean, you know, Cell phones are, you know, make a much bigger difference than in Africa than perhaps they even do in our lives. Um, and so, you know, being strategic about which technologies where, I think we've been seduced by these, you know, the success of the Facebooks and the Skypes where there are these huge adoption rates. And we think that things can just blow up 
in the internet space. The work that we need to do now is a much more methodical, incremental investing in people, providing skills, and, and, and it's a harder, longer road, I think. Thank you, Lucas. Um, let me just thank the panelists so much. Thank you, Auric, Lucas, Riz, Mike. <laughs> Our fearless leader, Sheldon, to let us know what's hello, next. Hello, hello. Mm -hmm. And let me thank Tamara for doing such a spectacular job moderating. <laughs> and Joel, thank you for what yes. you've done online today, you and Anand. And thank you all for being just a, a wonderful, wonderful audience. I realize I'm standing in a very dangerous place here um, between you and lunch, so let me be very brief. <laughs> um, first, special thanks to the Queen, um, Her Majesty Queen Noor, for joining us at the Institute and really setting this tone from the outset for a thoughtful, important, and really valuable conversation. Um, valuable because, as we saw and talked about today, one of the most profound media changes of the last 10 years is the fact that now we are all media makers. Um, social networking, the internet, digital handheld devices, and so forth, we're all empowered to produce images that, as we've seen from the research, can be part of the solution to the violence in societies, or it can be part of the problem. And so at the very minimum, we have a responsibility to stop and be thinking about some of the profound research findings that the Alliance of Civilizations Media Fund started to put before us and is continuing to research. We have to think about these things as we engage in the media business. Um, which reminds me, I want to thank our partners, the Alliance for Civilization Media Fund, who really helped us pull today's um, meeting together, and the executive director, Shamal Idris. Also, I want to thank personally a couple of people for their unfailing support for this media as global diplomat strand, um, Ambassador Solomon, Tara Sonnenschein, Mike Graham, Dan Serwer, Doug Lyons, our CIO, as you can see, this was very impressive, technologically speaking, to have Michael up from Hollywood, as well as um, the folks online. Uh, it worked beautifully. So thank you, Doug, and your team in the IS group, and Lauren Sutcher, your team in the public affairs group. It, we can't put an event like this together without a lot of hands and a lot of help, which reminds me of a couple of important staffers, Chris New, Anand Varghese here, uh, Joel Whitaker, as I said, um, and uh, uh, Dita, Dita Brent in IS, Michael Johnson on sound. Thank you all very, very much. We are really fortunate to have an incredibly talented team here. So, as some of you know, my dad was a school teacher. He used to say that the key to a really good meeting was that the speakers would deliver useful information, the audience would listen carefully, and we would all finish our jobs at the same time. And I think we met his bar for a good meeting. So with that, let me declare the meeting officially adjourned, and thank you all for coming.